Thank you again to Telefilm Canada for presenting this session and the close-up series. Before passing things off to our moderator, I'd like to briefly introduce today's speakers. Um, I just received word that unfortunately Anita Lee will not be able to join us today, but we still have five other speakers on today's call who are here to share their insight. Um, so first we have Charlene Coy. Charlene has been an executive leader with over 20 years experience in communications. Prior to opening her own agency, C2C Communications, she served as director of publicity at Entertainment One for 10 years as senior PR manager in NYC for ICM and held a number of board and committee chair appointments throughout. Next, hi Charlene. Uh, next we have Diane Schwamm. Uh, with a background in theatrical film marketing, Diane is a development consultant to Real Canada for partnership and sponsorship and is currently developing Jeffrey Archer's books to feature film and TV. Welcome, Diane. Uh, next, we have Jean-Christophe J. La Montaigne. Uh, Jean-Christophe is the president and co-founder of H264 Distribution. His goal in founding the company is to expand the reach of cinematographic works um, by forging strong relationships between audiences and creators. The same impulse brought him to co-found and pilot Plein Ecran, the world's first film festival to take place on Facebook. Uh, next, we have Mark Cohen. Hi, Jean-Christophe. Uh, next, we have Mark Cohen, well known for his work at studios Walt Disney Pictures and Warner Brothers Pictures. Mark has an exceptional represent sorry, an exceptional reputation in all specs aspects of media management, including marketing, branding, digital marketing, social media, publicity, partnerships, and promotions. Mark has worked alongside some of the world's most influential brands, distributors, and filmmakers, including the Harry Potter franchise, Happy Feet, 300, Life of Pi, Toy Story 2, and the untitled Scott Boris picture uh, currently in production. Hi, Mark. Uh, and now I will pass it off to our moderator for this session, Sama Ali. Uh, Sama is a distributor and film programmer and is the founder of Sisterhood Media, a production and distribution company streaming films about community and identity on their native platform, Sisterhood Media TV. She currently programs for Academy Award qualifying festivals, Hot Springs Documentary Film Festival, Doc NYC, and Hot Docs Film Festival, and focuses on building a more equitable future in the industry by working with filmmakers on their distribution strategies with her boutique consultancy, Strata Lee. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone, and welcome. Thanks, Katie. Um, I'm sure on behalf of everybody, everyone's saying hi and thank you, Katie, for the wonderful introductions and really breaking the ice for this conversation today. As mentioned, my name is Samah Ali and I'm going to be your gracious moderator, but the focus is really going to be on these wise folks in the room, Charlene, Diane, Jean-Christophe and Mark. Um, I'm going to get right into questions and please for everybody in the audience, Think about what you want to ask these wondrous folks and put it in the question box. We will be getting to it at the end of our session. OK, so my first question for all of you today is what was your first for your consideration awards campaign that you worked on? Charlene, let's start with you. Uh, hi, everyone. Thanks for having me. Uh, this question actually posed a little bit of panic when I first read it because I thought, oh my goodness, I have to go back 15, 16 years to figure out what that title was. There was uh, I've been very, very lucky to work on some really remarkable titles in my career. I'm guessing, and I hate to even say that I can't validate, I'm guessing it's Congorama, which was a very popular Quebec title that really kind of broke the mold outside of the Quebec market. And we did exceptionally well with it on a national level uh, at Entertainment One. And so I think that was probably my first, which uh, gave me so much experience doing a publicity campaign, especially for a bilingual type title with subtitles and getting it the commercial success that it needed running right into the awards campaign with it. Uh, and then I've been very lucky to do a number of titles that have been nominated. I would add that probably the most memorable year was a year that we had multiple titles competing against each other in the same categories, which always makes it really interesting when you're the head of publicity and you need to equally support all of them in their campaigns. And 2011, we had Barney's version and on Sandy basically going head to head in every category. So. That was definitely one of my most memorable years as well, having to do kind of simultaneous campaigns all at the same time. And I'm sure that was very stressful to maintain um, good parties with all of the filmmaking teams, let them know that, yes, I'm treating you equally. 
Well, we were very Canadian. We were all very friendly and very supportive of each other. So that was a, a definitely an attribute. And those films couldn't have been more opposite. They served to very different audiences at the same time. And they both were so equally successful in their own right. So it was uh, such a pleasure to be able to work on both of them. But that awards night was definitely a very challenging and interesting one going back and forth between all of them in every category. Wow, lots of learnings that we will definitely be getting to. Um, Jean-Christophe, I ask you the same question. What was your first campaign? Uh, yes, uh, <laughs> me too. I had to go back a bit and think about how everything unfolded. Uh, first, really happy to be here. Thank you for the invitation and very nice to be part of uh, such a great panel. Um, to give a bit of a background, H.264 started off as a shorts distribution only. We now do, of course, you know, feature film distribution and digital distribution, but you know, our first uh, approach was short films, which we still do today. So our first campaign was uh, back in 2018 for two short films called Fauve and Marguerite. Um, and what's interesting is that for short films, the way to get into you know an Oscar campaign is very dif different than our feature films. Uh, so we had to win you know Oscar qualifying awards and festivals. So we knew nothing about the Oscar campaign. Uh, the two films, and I'll talk about it a bit later on, had two very different, you know, path, uh, different festival selections, uh, and they both won, you know, a qualifying award. And then we just had to learn everything from the get-go. Uh, and I feel your struggle, you know, Charlene, having two uh, children that you have to love equally, and then they both get to the shortlist and they both get nominated. So it was, it was a bit of a challenge, but a great one. Uh, and yeah, they both went on to be nominated. So it was super uh, exciting to, to be on that journey, especially when the nomination uh, was released, the final list. We were in like in two separate rooms in the same office in case one was nominated and not the other team. And then both went on to be nominated. And then we just kind of gathered together in one room. Uh, so that was quite, uh, quite the experience, yeah. Wow, I'm very keen <laughs> to get into all these conversations <laughs> with the children, the children that are running in the same year. <laughs> Yeah. Um, Diane, I, can I get you into this conversation? What was your first campaign? Just unmute. We're in, you know what? It's never an event unless somebody needs to be <laughs> unmuted. <laughs> I'll be the most technically challenged person in the room today. Um, <clears throat> just listening to the four titles just mentioned, I mean, they were all excellent. And I'm sure you were glad that Robert Lantos ended up having the award in his hand at the end of the day. But being an Academy member, I struggled with both your shorts because they were just amazing. So it's, it's equally hard as a member to uh, consider and vote for, you know, the ones that you love. The Canadian aspect is interesting because I, I, I can go back further than anybody here just because I'm more mature than anybody else. But Chariots of Fire was sort of my first experience and, and uh segue into that world. And it really happened for us in Canada because we took a film from the UK that was basically unknown with actors that were unknown. And we premiered it at the Toronto Film Festival, but we found a Canadian angle which allowed us to get the people behind it because it was a true story. And we found family members in Canada, just outside of Toronto that were able to participate and add validity to everything we were doing. And then it became people's choice. And then it just, the momentum grew and grew and it won best picture that year. And I mean, it just uh, is my, probably my first memory of, of an Academy campaign that actually emanated out of Toronto, out of a film festival and out of people's um, popular choice. And I think that's a whole conversation as well, the power of festivals in, how they can actually bring so much fire, especially TIFF's People Choice. Like that's a huge award that really sets up films to be looked at and considered. Um, a lot of steam that I hope somebody in the audience has questions about that because we have limited time. And I don't wanna focus on so many different elements of the distribution process that can really impact what the For Your Consideration campaign looks like. Mark, same question to you. Okay, uh, thank you. I'm gonna answer it a little bit differently in terms of what my first was um, versus what the most memorable was for me. Um, Cause there are a lot of films that I worked on campaigns um, that nothing really stood out, um, unfortunately, but the, the, best, the best was Happy Feet in 2006. And 
reason I bring this up, we had like all odds going against us. Um, no other studio than besides Disney had won an Oscar for animated film. And I had learned from others the the best way to go about this is to find something controversial and stick to it. And we kind of did this in the reverse way. Um, George Miller, the director, he was phenomenal to work with uh, during the release of the film. Um, domestically and then internationally, he did a ton. And then he and his family went on the holiday. And as far as he saw it, he was done. You know, I spent, he's like, I spent a few months promoting it after several years making it. Well, he got back to his office in Australia with many messages from me saying, you need to come back to LA. And, you know, as he reminded me a few years later, the Steve Jobs scandal, the um, stock option scandal was like at the height uh, going on with Pixar. And he was really leading the charge for cars, which Disney Pixar had that year uh, up and was definitely the front runner. So I told George, I'm like, they've got to, they've got to stay out of this a bit. And now's your time to strike. And literally put together this massive campaign. George did come back. He went all over the US wherever we needed him. And Diane, I don't remember if he went up to Toronto at that yeah. time. Um, but it, literally everything came together and um, the film won. So <laughs> it was very exciting. And also, you know, working at Warner Brothers studio, not known for, in a way known for animation, but not known for um, truly supporting it in the award sense. It meant a lot more. I'm loving the way this uh, question has really been directed and really the most memorable campaigns. Mark, I'm going to keep it on you because we've talked a lot about what folks have in their minds is like, oh my God, a campaign or a year or a season where I had two films or I had a film that was just outstanding. What did you learn throughout all the campaigns that you've done? Um, that, uh, as you say, multiple filmmakers, every filmmaker wants what they don't have when they see that other films have it. And whether it's more money being spent on their campaigns or more events, and in many occasions had to explain, well, you don't have the talent available. They're all working on other films. Um, they're like, well, what if we can get them? It's like, if you can get them, great. Let's talk about it. We can put things together. And then they go silent because they can't get the talent out of their production commitments. Um, but the biggest thing balancing so many films at a major studio was um, trying to pinpoint who the audience is. And obviously you're going for Academy members or critics groups, um, you know, or other awards groups, but you want to do that through publicity as well, uh, which was my main focal point. So any type of stories that we could drum up, um, that would appeal to main audiences, which would then get more um, press that Academy members and so on would see. And also reaching out to the critics groups, many of which write editorial as well. It just kept those films, the actors, actresses, directors uh, in the spotlight. And that was the, that was the key, um, keeping them out there. You know, I worked on Life of Pi and that was a lot of fun because we had an amazing depth of below the line uh, filmmakers who were willing to do anything and everything that we asked of them. And they went to every event um, that made sense for them and some beyond. And they were also really supportive of each other, showing up at each other's events. Um, so that kept them out. And I think that's a big reason why the film did so well, um, you know, in the awards. That is really insightful. Um, does anybody else ha want to jump in with learnings that they had from for your consideration campaigns? I can jump in. Uh, <laughs> I, I think for for me, the, the three biggest takeaways uh, I've had was, you know, first, um, there are no definite path towards getting a nomination. And for me, one of the things I feel like I was, um, I'm really grateful uh, to have lived is to have had two films at the same time because it would have been too easy to have one film nominated and then you say oh this work i'm just going to copy paste what i did for the campaign of this film for all my other campaigns moving forward and when you look at what we did with Fove and what we did with marguerite it's two complete you know uh, strategy 
Faux was a film that was like a festival pleaser. It got selected everywhere. It won at Sundance. Uh, it, it was everywhere as opposed to Marguerite, which took about eight months to get its first festival selection. No festival selection in one of the big festivals. And it started more in, in, in like niche festival and um, more like festival that had huge uh, engaged community, especially in the LGBTQ plus communities. And we had more of a grassroots campaign. And to see like a film that had great buzz, another one that was more grassroots, to see both of them going, you know, uh, to the Oscars for us was a big takeaway to see that there are no precise strategy that you can just copy and paste. And you really have to think, you know, what this movie stands for and why is this movie relevant this year? And for me, that's like probably my biggest takeaway from, from the campaign. Um, and my second would be also like getting major partners, which we didn't have uh, three years ago. And we feel it was lacking in our campaign is, especially in the United States, either get like an actor or producer that can embark as an executive producer to really champion the film and be a promoter of the film or a media outlet that's gonna be like diffusing the film on their platform, on their channel and getting involved in the campaign. We felt like moving into the States when we got the nomination, that's something that was lacking to get the win. Uh, and the winner that year was Skin, which was a great film, don't get me wrong, but you know, Fox Searchlight stepped in two weeks you know, before the voting ended and they injected a lot of money and did a lot of work to get you know, a buzz going around the film. So for me, that was my, my second uh, takeaway. And the third one, well, I talked about it, but it's kind of to remove yourself from what this film, uh, whether it's good or not, it's not about, oh, this film is good or it's the best film. It's really, what, is, uh, what does this film stand for? You know, what transcends the film? What are the main themes? You know, what can connect with the audience and also the, the voters? Uh, I think for me, that's the most important thing that you have to think also prior to the campaign and prior to your film's distribution. Uh, and I think those would be my three biggest takeaways. Yeah. Anyone else? Charlene, Diane, no? I would kind of reiterate the same. I think to your point, every film is so uniquely different. I know that again, that kind of sounds cliche, but I think the success of that is when your marketing and your PR and your distribution sees that. You know, I can say from a distribution point of view, we know fairly early on when we feel we have that film that can go the distance. And so we're very strategic with that plan right from the very beginning. We know what festivals we're gonna target. We know when we really need to maximize access to the talent. We try to prep that filmmaker for the really long haul ahead of them. If it has a great premiere at TIFF and we know we're gonna get the people's choice or we have a chance, then we also know it's gonna elevate it to the next phase of that promotion, which will trigger a different budget, different marketing elements. Um, you know, there's a through line that you have to keep consistent, which is what we were just saying about the message of the film, the timeliness of the film. Um, you know, from an inside industry perspective, you know who you're going to to get the votes. You know that who are the voters, you know the industry awareness you need to get, but you also want to keep the heart of the film to make sure the audiences are really going to champion it. Because if the audiences are going out and seeing this film and the word of mouth continues to grow, 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 that appeals to the voters as well. So we have kind of like two lanes of thought that you're doing when you're running an awards campaign. It's not just industry and it's not just commercial, they kind of go together throughout the whole process. Charlene, I really want to hold it on you because I think you've opened up a lot of conversations right here. Um, when you see a film or when you secure a film, you've acquired it, how do you determine when it will need a campaign? And then once you know that it needs a campaign, how do you go from there? Because I'm sure, as Jean-Christophe mentioned, there's some sleeper hits that start mm -hmm. to come into the function and you need to be able to pivot and see, maybe this is a film we also need to consider making a campaign as well. Yeah, I think, you know, you just hit it. I think a trade secret uh, that we're probably all about to expose is that 
the distributors or the festival programmers, you all sit in a big empty theater and you watch the film for the first time. And then when the film, the credits roll, you all look at each other going, okay, we have to have a lot of strategy meetings. You know, that we loved it from script stage. And now that we've seen it at final, we know it can go the distance. And then all the heads of the department really get together to figure out how to really complement all of our efforts. You know, marketing has to be really strong. PR has to be really strong. The distribute like sales has to get it into the right theaters. We need to be competitive with the right release date. The release date needs to be smart to complement that festival premiere that we want. And every film has the better premiere festival to have. Some of the films are going to find their audience better at TIFF. Some of them are going to maybe go to Cannes. There's always that struggle with international distributors of where is the film going to have its first premiere and what will that do for the film. So it's very strategic from the from the get-go right before its very first screening. And then you do a work back from there. And you know, PR to, to Mark's point is knowing realistically how much access you're going to get to some of that talent and utilizing them to the best of your ability when you know you're going to get them versus you know you might not down the road so you bank a lot of opportunities with them you talk to the media about the fact that you know you need to get it now we can roll it out later um it, it's it all kind of is a work back calendar if you will and then sometimes you get those really great surprises where at the beginning of TIFF and you know and that no one has seen it yet, no review has come out yet, we are all holding our breath at the back of that theater. And then it starts to roll out and you get the good news you want. And then you really do pivot and you go to a completely different strategy right there standing in the theater of, okay, we have a chance to get people's choice. And what does that mean? And put all the laurels on the posters and get everybody out there to know that they need to vote and get the emails out so people do vote and you know your entire team collective. And sometimes there are titles that don't even have distributors to give you that help and they get discovered at a festival and you know those filmmakers and those producers could also probably really benefit from getting ready to kind of get that early momentum going for their film because without fail a distributor will scoop you up when they see they have a potential award film on their hands. Does anyone want to add off of that because I think it is I'll, I'll yes just... I'll say she's you're just so right on every level. You just like, I mean, and I know your experience and background at E1. I mean, you guys were masters at the People's Choice Awards. I mean, you were really, really, really good at way better than the American studios, actually, at knowing how to find your audience and getting people to vote and getting them to care. And it it didn't go unnoticed. Um, but everything that you've talked about on the work back. <clears throat> just reminds me how important it is for a filmmaker, and I'm sure there's many on this call today, they don't have the luxury of having a distributor or salespeople or marketing people behind them mm -hmm. when they're finishing a film. And I was just talking to Stephen Campanelli the other day about this because his film Drinkwater is out at Whistler, and he's going like, you know, we think it's got a real good chance for People's Choice Award, and you know, where do we go? Where do we? And he just needs all those things that you've just talked about. And that's what's missing. And that's what they need. And this is where telefilm and you know distributors and other people can help to take it from that script level through. I mean, he's just working it, working it himself. And there's just only so much a filmmaker can do. I mean, Indian Horse, he had a lot more success because he ended up getting a, you know, a distributor behind him. But I'm just saying in general terms, there's filmmakers out there who don't have that luxury. And everything you said about strategy is so important at the earliest level. So just reinforcing that. Somebody else want to jump in? <laughs> I know this is a hot topic about being able to identify a film and then also being able to know, oh, we need a campaign for this film. I'll just throw in one thing. You know, it, mm -hmm. you can certainly bring it back to awards, but overall publicity and marketing. Um, I've since I've left Warner Brothers, I've been working on a lot of independent films and come to realize a lot of these filmmakers don't realize what they need to do while they're in production to prepare for marketing, publicity, and eventual awards campaign down the road. And one, they don't budget for it. Um, two, they're not even thinking about it. So it's like when I've gotten involved, it's going back, you know, almost a year plus in time trying to compile whatever can be done. Again, actors, um, sometimes the filmmakers aren't even all that available. Uh, to do what's needed. And then if you've got the film that has um, a good shot at awards, 
they're all energized, but it, depending on the distribution of the film, it, your hands could be really tied. So I think planning as much in advance as you can and banking material, um, it's, it's all necessary. So I think people need to think about that. Mark, just to push you on that, what are some of the things that you wish people prepare at an earlier stage that when they get to you in front of you, that you want them to already have? Um, okay, this sounds really ridiculous, um, but it's come <laughs> up on several films that I've worked on. They don't have still photographs. You know, it's like they didn't think of it. And then I've had directors like, well, wait, I got some photos on my iPhone. And oh. uh, <laughs> it, it's unbelievable. And some pretty, you know, decent sized films. And it's just they didn't have it in their budget. And they, they weren't thinking about that. Um, production notes. I mean, these are the, the simple things. But um, I, I think the, the probably biggest thing is to sit down with the actors um, during production and kind of have the conversation of where this could go. Um, if the film ends up turning out well, as everyone expects or hopes, and what would potentially be needed? Because I've worked on films where that has happened and you've got the talent who are just ready to go um, when award season comes and so, or a couple of people that actually cleared their calendar um, around award season that they just love doing those type of events. It was also at a time when events were much freer to put on than they are now. Um, so it's just, it's getting people to understand the process. And, it, you know, Brad Pitt's an example who we were together and he had like 50 different questions for me about award season. You know, what happens with this and what happens with that? And it was going into Moneyball, um, which I wasn't working on. I was working with Angelina Jolie at the same time. Mm -hmm. And Brad was turning down everything that Sony had been asking at the time. And I'm like, well, these are the reasons, you know, why you need to do it. You know, simple Q and A's after the screenings which he just thought it was going to be, you know, he goes there and people ask him for photos and autographs afterwards. And so he ended up saying, going back to Sony saying, yes, you know, I'll do these. And then what was really funny, um, Angelina, she had her directorial debut that I was working on in the land of blood and honey, which she was also kind of hesitant to really get out there. Cause she's, she kept saying, I didn't make this movie for awards. You know, I just wanted people to see this. Well, she's hearing Brad's going to every Q and A that's being offered now. She's like, okay, I think we need to do some of those. I need to go out at night. And it, it's just educating them on what the point, what the purpose is and how they can benefit and how the film can benefit. Mm -hmm. That's really interesting. Um, Jean-Christophe, you unmuted. Do you have something to say? Yeah. Yeah. If I can add on, I, I mean, I complete, completely agree with everything that was said. And if I can add something, uh, I think also people in terms of marketing, uh, you know, items and elements to be produced, uh, you know, producing the basics elements is like a struggle, stills, poster, you know, trailers, but also a key for a campaign now is to get more materials, you know, get as much behind the scene footage, you know, get as much as uh, director's notes or clips or audition tapes, you know, that's something that we talk about early on in the process, usually even before shooting with the team is like, you know, get as much materials as you can while you're making the film because it's going to be helping in the campaign. Uh, you know, one of the things we, we believe is really important is to create a, a, a digital identity for the film as early on as possible. You know, put the film out there, making sure that people know that this film is going to be released eventually either at a festival or in theaters for feature films. But, but I think having a campaign, a digital campaign mostly, that can be spread you know, during eight to 12 months and still be relevant, not just reposting the same things. So I think now that's one of the biggest challenge to produce more elements to really, you know, accompany the, the, the campaign and enrich the campaign. And the second thing I think is to make sure that everyone understand that this is a collaborative effort. And, you know, it's really a marathon. There's no specific action that you say, okay, if you do this, it's gonna increase your chances of being nominated by 20%, like automatically. It's the combination of dozens and dozens of actions 
that increases your the probability of going, you know, to get a, nomin a nomination. So you need to have the director on board, the producers on board, the publicists on board, the distributors on board, and making sure that everyone understands what you know the, the plan is and to follow that plan. So I think planning is also a key and producing as much materials as possible because that, that's my two cents and maybe my, my colleagues won't, won't, won't agree, but to my point, to get to like the short list, I think it's mostly about marketing and creating a buzz and you know getting press. And it's not about the film itself, as I said, it's about what it stands for, but it's about creating noise because you have to just get people to watch the film and connect with it. But once you get to the short list and you get to like that kind of five to 10 to 15 films, now I think it's mostly the film that will speak for itself. Is the film good enough? So I think for, for us, especially the, the toughest part is to get from 180 qualified films to that 15 list of you know, shortlisted films. Uh, and that's campaign, collaborative work and uh, festivals also, festivals are the key. And I would definitely say for any of the filmmakers who do end up connecting with the distributor to trust the professionals <laughs> who've done these campaigns multiple times over for years, because while it might be somebody's first time, it won't be a lot of people who are working behind the scenes first time. Yeah. Um, Diane, and it's I not wanna... a science. We oh, try. Yes. We, sorry, it, it's not a science. I mean, we try different stuff. Sometimes we'll early release the film online. Sometimes we won't. Sometimes it works. Sometimes it doesn't. I mean, every year we have films that have qualified and we try stuff. And I think you also have to have fun with it. You know, and there's no uh, do's and don'ts about with some exceptions, but I think it's mm -hmm. also to try stuff, uh, especially with everything that's changing now with the platforms and everything. You just need to, to try to get your film out there as much as possible. Sorry for cutting you up. Sorry, I apologize for cutting you off, Jean Christophe. And I actually, I want to shout out one film. I think a film called Snowy, um, directed by Caitlin Schwalje and Alex Lewis. Um, that is a film, a short film that has gone to over 80 festivals. And so now they are doing a foyer consideration campaign and they were acquired by Time Studios. And that was something that this is their first time. They are bright eyed and bushy tailed, have never done this before. And they are really learning exactly what is happening, <laughs> what they need to do. Yes, yeah, Charlene. I just want to add to your point, because it's, I think, a perfect segue to what both of you were just saying. Having been so involved in the distribution work, I also really encourage filmmakers to ask the questions of the distributor, to do your work with them. And yes, the distributor are the experts. They know how to run these campaigns, but nobody knows your film better than you. So be involved as much as you can. Ask the questions. It, you know, some distributors welcome it more than others, for sure. And that's a whole other conversation. Um, but as you know, for doing PR for so many years, I really cherish those relationships with the filmmakers. They were really excellent to go back and collaborate with and, you know, know the media who are going to gravitate to the film, know the media who might not technically love that film and explain that to the filmmakers and vice versa. And I, I just encourage filmmakers not to fear collaborating with the distributor and, and really, um, you know, give feedback. Sometimes you're going to win some of those conversations. Sometimes you're not going to for various reasons. But I, I do uh, strongly suggest that they be as involved a, as much as the distributor welcomes them to be. I see um, the question box and the chat is going wild. And I'm just going to let y'all know we're almost 10 minutes, we're actually less than 10 minutes away from the question time. So please, if you have any questions, put it into the Q&A box and we will get to it very shortly. And I'm looking at my questions and it's looking like I'm not gonna be able to answer, ask everything. So I'll be um, very terse with um, what the next 10 minutes look like. Um, Diane, I want to get you in here. Uh, what is the difference between a domestic campaign versus an international mm -hmm. campaign? And what are some of the techniques that um, are done between Canada and other countries? I actually think that question is better directed to Mark because he worked with Mark. Mm -hmm. Yeah, from I was student. gonna um, say perfect person to call on, Diane. <laughs> <laughs> How about we'll both help each other out? Okay. Sounds good. You go first. Who wants to start? <laughs> well, thanks. Well, I, my um, main experience is domestic. So, you know, but I worked 
very hand in hand with our international departments, um, which shockingly, um, early days, there was no relationship between international and domestic, which I never understood. It was literally like two different companies. Um, so we'd have a campaign domestic and then international. And that was also back in the days when they weren't day and date as much as they are. Uh, but then international would take what worked and they'd run with that. And then gradually um, release dates started coming more in line. So there needed to be more working together, um, which at first was a learning experience. So again, every market is different internationally. Um, so you've got to know that audience in those local offices, you know, for the studios or local distributors for more indie films know those markets. They know what materials or have a pretty good idea what will work, what won't. Um, sometimes you've got talent who just are not either well-known or are not liked in a market. So you've got to leave them out or factor them in in a bigger way. Domestically, it was always interesting because we were on the front line and had to throw everything um, basically at the wall and see what stuck, uh, which was which was interesting a lot of times because, you know, you'd get it right, um, but then you'd find things that would work better um, as you were doing it and have to pivot really quickly. And it was fun working with International um, once the release dates, you know, were on top of each other. Um, like we use Harry Potter films, for example. We couldn't get enough material for it domestically. And Warner Brothers International people were absolutely amazing. The creative people were incredible. So we would take a lot of their artwork that they would use for one sheets in different countries and we'd give it as exclusives here in the US. You know, Entertainment Weekly would have run a Harry Potter cover every week if they could have. Um, they sold that well for them. And, um, you know, I remember like USA Today, Parade Magazine, we took international posters and they did um, poster inserts in the publications and it was just it, it was really really great so that you know one way of working together and obviously all the filmmaker uh, publicity back and forth and I'm going to let Diane jump in now well, I was just going <laughs> to add too much no it's okay I was adding I uh, thinking about current times and what's happening now with film festivals like it just it isn't um, it, it isn't necessarily the only way to go, but on the international market, you can see the amount of emphasis that's put on getting films into Berlin and Venice and London and all the other foreign territories and getting the awards that you mentioned, Charlene, so they can have the laurels on the one sheet. And I had a small experience with a documentary that I executive produced and we worked it pretty hard as best we could with the budget we had. And on the international market, because it was about the environment and the melting of land ice, we actually were able to garner more attention from scientific associations and membership and environment groups around the world. But then out came this documentary by a former vice president and Leonardo DiCaprio and nothing else was going to touch it. You know, it was going to win that year. Um, so it, I guess from my point of view, now the way the market is playing out is you got to get into those festivals and try and secure awards from those festivals because they really do help to carry you when a director gets this or a screenwriter gets that and it allows them again to do more social media related to those awards. So that's just sort of my little take on it. Jumping in on that, you know, with streaming that's going on so prevalently now, um, so much of it's day and date um, around the world. So you've got to get all this publicity or marketing out there well in advance. So you've got one shot at the movie being a success, getting the reviews. Um, if you're going to do a review driven campaign, getting that all together um, in advance and keeping it going. And social media plays a huge factor. Um, just anything digital really that's going to reach your audiences. And when you're looking for awards, you also want to reach the media that are gonna be paying a lot of attention to award season so they can kind of get a sense of what's hot. Um, Cause believe it or not, you know, they're not always on top of it. And they like to look at what other people are talking about, which is interesting. I've seen films that have had no heat from 
press or excuse me from critics and then editorial coverage and social media um, talk just completely changes direction and then everyone else is like oh this is the movie we got to see this is a you know could be a front runner so Mm -hmm. it's just keeping it hot on all angles and really you know I I think throwing as much different content out as possible um, which the digital age there's so much available so I think being creative with it is the key. Anything that Charlene, John Christophe, you want to add? I, I would just echo it. Maybe I think that the, oh, go ahead. the ever evolving media landscape and the relevance of social media and the platforms are going to kind of go hand in hand. Media are also using social media these days as well and, you know, trying to garner as much impressions and bring traffic back to their outlets. So it all plays into the amount of content you have to promote, the amount of content you can offer and, you know, control your own narrative through your social media and your marketing that rolls out on all your digital platforms, as well as giving enough content because media need digital content as well. And so I find like in PR, we have a lot more success if we can give them access that's going to allow them to have social media content in addition to supplementing their editorial or their interview. A lot of it is Facebook lives or can you have an exclusive trailer online? Can you do this? Can you do that? Because they also need to compete with all of the impressions that people are getting on social media. So to bring it even further back, that's why you have to have a plethora of content to be able to shop out and have the right marketing and PR people to help navigate that for you, to hold back certain pieces and use those as first look exclusives. And who do you offer that to? And who do you let the cast do it? You know, you'll see a lot of cast now dropping trailers on their own. You're not doing the Entertainment Tonight exclusives anymore, but you still have to nurture the media who are gonna be the voters as well. And you have to be mindful of that so that's where it all comes back to strategy and working with the filmmakers and producers on an abundance of content because you're also not just thinking of that first window that festival or that theatrical or that streaming window if it goes long haul for awards you need that content as well so you need to be able to create stories to create extra content Jean Christophe yeah I would just add that uh, you know the, the short film industry is very different than the feature film Uh, So there are almost no differences between the domestic market and the international market. Mm -hmm. I think the only difference would be, you know, festivals, because as a short film distributor, you work with your films worldwide. So, you know, there's no theater releases. So the the notion of a domestic market is almost inexistent in short films. Uh, And also since there are no theater releases, festival is your main release window. It's your main market. So I would say what's the biggest difference would be you know, if you're aiming to have your film nominated at the Canadian Screen Awards or in Quebec, the Iris Awards, well, the Canadian film festivals are as important as a Sundance selection or as a Berlin selection. So, you know, don't, of course, everyone wants to have that laurel from, from Cannes, from Berlin, from Venice, but also don't forget those, uh, you know, VIF, St. John's, Halifax, FNC, uh, you know, Sudbury, Edmonton, Calgary. These are huge festivals that will help also your campaign because there's also the Canadian Screen Awards and the Iris Awards. Uh, I was not paid to by the Academy to say this, <laughs> but 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 it's it's important, and uh, I, I think that would be the, the the main difference from my point of view. Yeah. Well, let's get into audience questions. And while this is something that is actually on my question list, a lot of people have asked. Um, for smaller and independent productions, how can they gain access to resources when preparing for a four-year consideration campaign? Who wants to take this? I, I think it's a question for telefilm. I think that, um, and I can, I can say that having come from a studio and watching what's going on in the Canadian marketplace, <clears throat> I frankly think that there needs to be more money. And I know they've already addressed this by giving marketing dollars to filmmakers and distributors to help with the Canadian uh, battle, if you like, against all the other competition. So I think Charlene nailed it. <clears throat> You've got to have the right skill set behind your picture from the beginning, and that takes a financial commitment. So it can't come in later, like down the road after five festivals and they start to look good. Now what do we do? Too late. Not too late, but I mean, it should be earlier. So I think that that's the money that could be put <clears throat> 
to good use for filmmakers in advance in planning their strategy for an awards campaign. Mm -hmm. Anyone want to add? Mm -hmm. uh, I, well, I would say in. for- We keep talking over each other, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, for, for independent uh, production, uh, I, I would say, uh, Diane mentioned this very, very well. Um, you have to address it early on as possible. Uh, you know, you have to talk with the team about, you know, if the film has a potential to, to go to, you know, the Oscars, how much it will cost, uh, because there's really an issue in terms of funding, you know, usually Sodec or Telefilm embarks uh, when the film gets either on the shortlist or gets nominated. But, you know, the main key, I mentioned it, is to get to the shortlist. That's where you have to put the money. That's when you have to hire a publicist. So that's a very neuralgic period for the film. Um, so what we do is we're really upfront with the team about how much it will cost. And what we try to do is to drive sales with the film and take the money from these sales and inject a part of it in the campaign. So we really have like a side pool of, of money that we're generating from festival screening fee or for sales that are gonna be targeted towards the campaign. But uh, you know, it can be not quite expensive, but at least I would say for short films, 10 grand can get you a long way to the shortlist, uh, but uh, but yeah, it's really a struggle. That's from the financial point of view, but there are other resources. And I think it's also being able to um, try to get these ambassadors, I talked about it earlier on in the panel, get those promoters and ambassador. It can be festival programmers that love the film. It can be, of course, friends and family, people that you know have engaged with the film. When you start to campaign, reach out to these people and say, like very humbly, you know, my film has a potential to go all the way. Uh, here's ways you can help by either, you know, share posts or, you know, being engaged in a campaign and try to also expand your, your inner circle of people that can help the campaign. And that's a huge resources and it costs, you know, nothing. So I think it's to get a balance of these two. Yeah. Charlene. Um, I would just add that there's so many of us who have been in distribution world for a long time and now kind of borderline independent as well and we we do it for the love of the industry there's a lot of people that you can hire or consult and resource that can also help guide you if you don't have the big muscle of a distributor behind your film yet and to everyone's point bringing them on early on during production or even once you wrap would probably be a really wise investment just to again, to be able to strategize, if nothing else, to sit down going, what goals, what festivals do you want to get into? How do you go about approaching them? What kind of materials do you have and putting that all together? I think, um, you know, there's a lot of people who do it for the love of the industry and you can find those experts out there who do have the knowledge and wherewithal that can work with you, even if you don't have a distributor behind you to kind of discover the festivals and the people that you can reach out to and the networks that you need to go and get your film to do private screenings and lists and all of that, there are options out there. You just have to kind of go seek them. Mm -hmm. um, we have a lot of questions about um, cost of campaigns, but then also um, how to target Academy members, voting members for the Canadian Screen Awards. Does anyone want to capture these two? I want to take it. I'll go first and then someone can jump yes. in. Um, what I would suggest is if, again, if you don't have a distributor, but you know, you want to get as much eyeballs on it, it's all about awareness. It's having a strategy to host screenings, you know, up until this point, everything had to be virtual. So if you can do virtual better, and there are platforms and companies out there that are hosting virtual group screenings, like a company Whovi in Vancouver has been doing it really successfully. And it, it really also encourages community engagement, filmmaker Q and A's afterwards, you know, reaching out to your general audience, but reaching out getting your film in front of industry get them to watch it and then engage in those conversations and then that carries your word of mouth to social media that then somebody says well now i want to host a screening get testimonials from industry insiders who carry influence you know you can get the right people to do it and then give you a poll quote reach out to the media get media endorsement put all of that together and package it that will kind of really start to help the momentum behind your film Anyone have anything to add? Um, I'm really curious about um, 
kind of building off of this question, um, how to appeal to not just Canadian screen members, but other boards, other voting bodies um, in an international um, realm, especially just south of the border in the United States, how can these Canadian films be able to attract audience members in the States who also are voting members? Just so I understand better the question. So you're asking, how can Canadian films stand out in the crowd of, you know, North American films? How do we yes. make them? Mm -hmm. I, I would also add, a lot of people don't realize how many Canadian media and Canadian, how many voters are Canadian. You know, I think that that would, That's you true. Would, we would hope that we would have more and maybe down the road we'll qualify for more, but there are some very influential Canadians who are Academy voters as well, who are industry people. And then again, it, we keep saying festivals, festivals, but the festivals really do garner like the Hollywood Ford Press Association, for example, they have a really big presence at TIFF. They come and they really do a lot of conferences. They do a lot of dinners, they do. And again, that's usually more helpful when you have a distributor to get their eyes on that but yeah. you know a lot of resources a lot of your PR and marketing consultants have those contacts and have those lists so it's worth the investment to really have them consult on your campaign and give you the advice of how to get it in front of the international voters and awards committees as well. I'll just throw in there are awards consultants who specialize and you know for us as we call it, international films but Finding those, whether it's the international journalists that live here in the U.S. or whatever other countries, and they've got tremendous ways to get the films in front of them, along with any materials, um, had great success at lining up interviews with the key media. Um, and then obviously, if the film is distributed here in the States, um, what the distributor can throw in there. And it used to be quite expensive for an independent and especially international filmmakers to get attention by the Academy members because everybody was using DVDs. So that cost and Mark, Mark <laughs> you experience in that, but now everything is on an Academy website. So you can virtually watch things and it's probably, I don't know what the cost factors are for studios. Well, to load 12 and a half thousand dollars for anyone per film to get it uploaded. And would that still not be a ton cheaper, Mark, than the old way that they had to get DVDs out to, you know, 5,000 members? Um, that is massively cheaper. So that's <laughs> why there's films. I mean, last year, you know, COVID year one, I don't I think there were over, I think close to 300 or over 300 films um, in the main category that were available. And I mean, films that were, was this a TV movie, you know, just some of them, where'd they come from? Mm -hmm. um, this year, they're still adding, um, you know, quite a few, but it's up to just over a hundred. Um, so, I mean, they've got a long way to go. Mark, Mark and I are on the uh, International Film Committee where they split the titles up amongst a committee that will commit to watch all the titles or at least 19 in each, cat, in each uh, grouping. And it's kind of an honor and a privilege to be able to do it because some of the finest films that are coming out at award season are from the international market, including yeah. Canada. I, I watch Drunken Birds. It's amazing. So to have that in that wheelhouse for the world to watch is only good for Canada, only good for the filmmakers and um, a new opportunity, I think. And Charlene, to your point, there's more and more members. I think when I started, it was like 500 people and now there's probably at least maybe a thousand, two thousand members in Canada, something like that, and, and more every year. And I think, oh, sorry, just one last thing. Um, I heard a few people talking last year with the number of films that were up there, um, and everyone was like desperate to watch films. Um, you know, they they went through everything on Netflix and everywhere else. <laughs> So a lot of people were watching some of these smaller films that they normally never would have seen and whether or not they were awards um, potential, it brought to light a lot of new filmmakers that may not have been, you know, ever heard from before, you know, and a lot of actors and actresses. So even if, you know, someone's got hopes for a big awards campaign, but they can't afford it, if they can 
afford the twelve and a half thousand to get it submitted, you're going to get it in front of a lot of eyeballs, and it could help, you know, that film, but it could also help you in the future. Um, we're in our last minute, and we've had two people ask this question. I think it's quite important. Um, if you have a film that you did not particularly have a for your consideration campaign nor a distributor behind you that has done well on the festival circuit, what is the best recommended course of action from there, especially in the case that you win a jury award? Who wants to take this? I think uh, for me, the uh, best advice I could give would uh, find the right publicist. Um, I, I think having a publicist, and it also piggybacks to the conversation about getting into the United States, um, you know, th they know the press, they know the voters, they know the right also partners to, to get, you know, momentum and awareness towards your film. Uh, but, but for us getting, you know, the right publicist, uh, we've been working with Catherine and Scott from London Fair PR for many years now, and uh, she play an integral part of, uh, you know, you know, uh, piloting the campaign. Uh, so yeah, if there's one thing you have to do, I would recommend this. Amazing. Well, I want to thank all of you for being so kind and sharing your wisdom with everybody in the room here today. Um, it's been such a brilliant conversation and there's so much more to unpack, I'm sure, but we only have one hour with each other. So thank you, thank you so much. Um, I also want to thank everybody else at home for being here um, and really asking really amazing questions. It's been a wondrous hour and I want to pass it to Katie um, back to close us out. <laughs> Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Sma. Um, I also just want to echo uh, Sma and say that I want to thank Charlene, Diane, Jean-Christophe, Mark, and Sma for today's conversation. Um, and another thank you as well to our partners at Telefilm Canada for presenting this session.